Hi, this is Lindsay Oden, Special Research Assistant at the Washington State Attorney General's Office, and this is your AGL Moment in History. In this series, our office will be releasing clips from our Oral History Project, an ongoing effort to collect and preserve the history of the Attorney General's Office as told by the people who have worked here over the years. In today's episode, the last episode with General Eikenberry, former Deputy AGs Jeff Goltz and Shirley Batten interview him about his highlights during his tenure as Attorney General. Among them are the three cases he argued before the U.S. Supreme Court, Washington v. Seattle School District No. 1 in 1981, Washington v. United States in 1982, and Malang v. Cook in 1988. He also discusses death penalty cases, his time as President of the National Association of Attorneys General, and the amendment to the state constitution broadening the rights of victims of crimes. Let's take a listen. So, um, uh, another in the earlier part of your administration, I was in the revenue division. So I love to talk about taxes, and I recall at that time there was a uh, a major case going to the U.S. Supreme Court about taxation of federal contractors, and I recall that that's one of the cases that you argued before the U.S. Supreme Court. And so, tell us a little bit about what it's like to to go for the highest court in the land and and argue cases that's worth millions and millions of dollars and yeah. huge, huge principles involved. Well, first of all, it's really interesting to be in the Supreme Court uh, as an arguer and see that the uh, justices are arrayed in a circle that almost uh, comes around on both sides of you. So, in a sense, it becomes fairly intimate. And, um, and they're very close. Uh, they are very close, and uh, so in that sense. Um, but in preparation for the argument, uh, I had followed the practice of Slade Gorton, whose reputation was just uh, bar, par excellence uh, is as a presenter of arguments for the state U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, but I had followed his example in uh, preparing for this argument, by going back, uh, I don't know, two, three, four days in advance, and uh, with a couple of people from the office, and I think three people in that case, and one of them was uh, Phil Austin. And Phil's mantra, he said, look, he said, you've got to use every opportunity to uh, use the phrase... I know, the, I know this phrase. Go ahead. Everybody <laughs> pays. I know, yeah. That's right. <laughs> Right. Everybody pays. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so we did that throughout the argument. Mm -hmm. And of course, the U.S. Supreme Court finally uh, did agree with us on that case. Yeah. Five to four. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're right. It was, <laughs> you're, well, and that kind of makes up for the case, the busing case, which I initially argued, yeah. kind of lost five to four. Yeah. And uh, then there was a criminal case that mm -hmm. was a lot easier. Yeah, so th that was, how did you decide, uh, Slade Gorton argued a lot of cases, um, not everyone. You argued three. Your successor, Chris Brigger, argued, I think, three as well. How do you decide which ones you handle and which ones you let some other lawyer in the office handle? Well, I was, uh, after that first case, which I felt had not gone very well, um, I felt compelled to take on one or two others, and that very simply was the reason. And in fact, it, I don't know that it's scattered out evenly throughout the three terms but uh, that I served, but anyway, that's the way I did it. So another issue that came up, um, comes up frequently, or has come up with the Attorney General, are death penalty cases. Did you have to face death penalty issues while you were in the office? We did. Um, we faced it in a couple of ways. Um, of course, what would happen is that after the individual was... Uh, committed to the federal to the state custody, and usually after the um, appellate uh, the appeal process had run its course through this through uh, from the prosecutor's point of view, then they would begin. Then the defense counsel would be ha begin hashing, in my view, hashing the thing up into tiny slices so they could present them as uh, a being a reason for giving a new trial or declaring not guilty on the premise of habeas corpus. 
And as a matter of fact, uh, I felt the process was being abused uh, to the point that uh, the issue came up in front of the National Attorney General Association, and uh, the other the other AGs agreed with me. In fact, we had unanim I think we had unanimous agreement on this, and we presented a report to then President uh, Reagan. I think he was in his final years uh, there, and. Um, um, we asked that uh, that they amend this law, that they amend the habeas corpus law. So it's an interesting thing that people regard habeas corpus as being sacrosanct, and in constitutional terms, I think it is. It should be. But uh, the fact is that Congress has passed, uh, has formalized the process and made it possible to uh, cut it up into little pieces. Most recently, I've been at a continuing legal education conference where uh, the uh, attorney representing Governor Inslee was present and was making his argument, of course, he being very much opposed personally, on a personal basis, to the death penalty. And uh, my view was that, uh, you know, if you... <laughs> my view was that... <laughs> What I was going to say is that if you haven't been there personally and asked a jury and gone through the emotion uh, as a lawyer of uh, whether or not you're going to ask the jury for to return a death penalty, you really have no business as a lawyer of making this kind of claim. Anyway, he, he insisted that uh, lawyers were not deliberately dragging out these cases to make them expensive and thereby, uh, therefore, something the states would reveal. And, uh, but he's winning on that one. Um, that, I, I was just going to add that uh, when I was in office, uh, what we would, what we did, what we adopt, did was adopt a, a practice of um, d developing a memorandum showed all the steps that these lawyers, that these defendants had gone through, and then hand them out to the media guys. Mm -hmm. And they were sh surprised and shocked even mm -hmm. at uh, how, many, how much caution was being taken. Well, uh, you were elected president of the National Association of Attorneys General. Right. Do you remember what year that was? I think it was 1990. Okay. And what led you to that, and what did you decide to focus on? Well, I had, um, I guess I had aspired to be uh, the president of that organization and uh, to provide leadership in the direction that I hoped it would take. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, I had been president of the uh, Western AG's conference, and so this seemed like a natural step uh, of progression to take. And we did have, uh, I can't, I don't know if it was the year that I served as president or which, but uh, we did have a conference here of National Association people here in Seattle. And uh, it was a very successful conference. We had a great turnout, and as, uh, as I recall, one evening, we had dinner over uh, at the uh, Indian encampment on, on the island, on oh, one sure, island. Sure. And we got there by a float plane, uh -huh. which was kind of a kick because we loaded all of the AGs on one bus or another and flew them over there. One thing I recall was um, a session where we were, <laughs> we again, it was a committee that made a presentation to the President of the United States urging them to support our efforts to curtail uh, attorney's fees in so-called civil rights cases. Because the rule of thumb was, at that point, was that if, if, a, if, any, if a person could bring any kind of, any lawsuit that they could label as being a civil rights case, and they won any single aspect of the case, then suddenly they were uh, entitled to attorney's fees, which we felt was egregious manufactured lawsuits. And as a matter of fact, one of the props that I used during this presentation was a book with a flycover that had 
a large green dollar sign, and the title of the book was How to Make Money Out of Civil Rights Litigation. So that made my point. Right, right. So we're coming to the end here of our questions. Um, and if anything else comes to mind, just pipe up. But but we've talked, you were in the office for 12 years, and so what are some of the, what's the biggest high point? What was your best best time, best feeling, and we'll flip that and get to the, the downside. <clears throat> well, um, I think the, one of the most important accomplishment uh, the, the, and the thing that gave me the best feeling was the passing of the uh, constitutional amendment which gave victims of crime the right to be heard in criminal cases and uh, the right to be heard to be advised and be heard before the defendant is released from custody. And, uh, of course, it came off, uh, it, it was part and parcel of my experience with my cousin having been killed in a highway accident. But it most pointedly came from the re, uh, as a result of being on the commission uh, that was on victims, so the crime victims uh, and their rights in judicial proceeding. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's <laughs> every time that uh, there's a newspaper story that talks about how the family or the, or the survivors of a victim of crime appears at the time of sentencing and makes their statement, my wife points out that that's the result of the law that we passed. So I'm, it makes me very good, very, feel very good about that. But the um, perhaps the the thing that the other thing that I was I'm most pleased about is the fact that the um, people from the Office of Attorney General that I run into uh, even to this day uh, say that it was a good place to work. They feel like they were fairly treated, that uh, they were recognized for the work they did, and that. Uh, that they were allowed to flourish independently from any particular program I might have. Oh, that was sort of true with the two of us. Yeah. And the downside, what was some of the, what was a, a, the bad time that you had to do over again to do something differently? Hmm. Well, I th the one really dumb thing that we did was uh, to uh, tell so, them... And you're saying this is something we did. Now it's a plural we. That did this. Well, <laughs> well, I have to admit, it. well, maybe, maybe it wasn't primarily <laughs> my responsibility. <laughs> anyway, it was to tell the legislature that no, we would not appoint someone to uh, represent them that they wanted mm -hmm. in a particular case. And uh, actually, the model for having done that was available in. Uh, in the case of the governor, because in the governor's instance, it's routine to appoint the gov the person that he designates as his uh, attorney, assistant attorney general assigned to him, and uh, that way he's protected by having received legal advice. Uh, and, and you designate the governor's legal counsel as a specialist, as an assistant attorney general. Exactly yeah. right. On the other hand, um, I remember one time when uh, the then superintendent of public instruction wanted to uh, have us represent him in denying access to certain records. And we said no, that the law is very clear that the, those records are available for review. And uh, after some arguing back and forth, we finally said, okay, uh, we will appoint someone, but it's going to come out of your budget, not the Attorney General's budget. And uh, It'll be up to the judge to distinguish and recognize who that person really is. Um, hardest decision you ever had to make? What was the most difficult decision you ever had to make as a judge? Hmm. Well, it does none comes to mind uh, yeah. offhand. I there were probably issues that I uh, certainly took my time in deciding, but mm -hmm. 
None of them were more tougher than the others. And how about something you learned as Attorney General that, that, you know, what would you, or what did you perhaps pass on to your successors? What's some something you learned in your 12 years there that you didn't know when you came in? Well, that's an interesting <clears throat> question because um, <clears throat> I certainly have passed on advice to chairman of the Republican Party, uh, which they have not accepted. <laughs> <laughs> But I haven't felt that same way about yeah. uh, passing yeah. on yeah. my experience yeah. to other successes. One of the, you know, I know during the 12 years uh, you were in uh, in office, I had a great time. What were some of the, the good times? What was what made you laugh? What was the funnest times? It wasn't all serious business. I really enjoyed our conferences. Uh, we When we would go to... Uh, I remember one year we went to Port Angeles. Mm -hmm. We were at a government facility out there, and uh, we played baseball, and, mm -hmm. and we had a, a really good, I thought it was a good time. And others, I, I think it was probably those conferences were the standout times that I remember. I remember that. I remember that sound. Uh, so if a third-year law student wanted to become came to you and asked for career advice, and in particular whether you thought the Attorney General's office was a good place for them, what would you say? <laughs> well, of course, I would be very positive. And it's interesting that you would uh, pose the question that way because uh, when I was in office, uh, one day my secretary advised me that there were some interns that were uh, there in the room on a, in, the, in the building where we were located, and uh, I should go back and say hello, which I did. And uh, one of them said, uh, and my dad said to say hello to you. And I took another look at him and asked him his name again, and it turned out to be the son of a fellow that I had gone through law school with. And... Uh, so I and I was glad to see that he was a lawyer, and uh, and I would advise him that the Attorney General's office is going to give you the fastest route that I can think of into very serious matters uh, that you will really devote yourself to. It's it's kind of like saying that a person should go into a prosecutor's office for uh, trial experience. And granted, uh, you will gain that uh, probably as uh, most positions, many positions, as Attorney General. But in addition, I would think that uh, the seriousness of your responsibilities as Attorney, Assistant Attorney General are bigger, broader, deeper. And so, winding down, but what do you feel your impact was on the Attorney General's office? And what do you hope to be remembered for? Well, I'm very pleased with the fact that the office was uh, put onto a computerized system. So we know where the cases are, what their status is, who's assigned to them, and uh, how, they're, how they're doing. I'm very pleased with the fact that we were successful in uh, getting a constitutional amendment passed here in the state of Washington uh, to benefit uh, the victims of crime. I'm very pleased with the uh, number of people who've come, gone on to be pillars of the community, if you will, uh, whether they um, are retired, such as the two of you are, or whether they're uh, whether they've left the office early to take on other uh, public positions, and uh, so those are the three things, those personal relationships and then the other accomplishments that I'm most proud of. So that wraps up our questions. Anything else you would like to talk about? No, I think that <laughs> you've pretty well <laughs> exhausted the subject. <laughs> we tried. Yeah. It's been our pleasure. Thank very you very much. much. Very Thank you very much, and again... I uh, my hat is off to to you folks and to the attorney general for uh, making this stab at at an office 
at making a record for an office that's very well respected, I think, in this state and in others, and also for achieving a greater level of harmony among lawyers in the office. Thanks for listening to this AGO Moment in History. Be sure to like and subscribe to receive updates when we upload a new episode. On our next episode, we'll hear an interview with Dr. Robert Keppel, an investigator in the AGO's Criminal Justice Division who helped the AGO investigate some of the state's most heinous crimes. Thanks. Talk to you again soon.